Salut sur vous, citoyennes et citoyens, bienvenue sur le Nexus 6. Je suis le capitaine. Nous avons l'honneur de recevoir sur notre vaisseau spatial l'auteur le plus prolifique du Space Opera de ces 30 dernières années. Il est là pour la sortie de son nouveau livre, Une brèche dans le ciel, le premier tome de la trilogie de l'Arche Spatiale. Cet auteur est anglo-saxon, donc je vous invite à enclencher les sous-titres sous la vidéo si vous ne parlez pas la langue des Spice Girls. Et moi, je suis ravi et fier de recevoir Peter F. Hamilton. Oh, you're ready. I am. Oh, thank God. <sighs> Peter, thank you for being here. Oh, thank you for inviting me. First time in the spaceship, I guess. It is, yes. Welcome to the 24th century on the Nexus 6. Thought it was the name of a replicant. Oh, nice. One question of the quiz done. <laughs> uh, he was not in it. It's more complicated. Uh. You're an author, I would say a sci-fi author. I would like to know how you started writing sci-fi, but first of all, what is your first contact to science fiction? First time was, you know, the Jerry Anderson Thunderbirds? Yeah, of course. That's the one everyone remembers. He actually did two seasons of other things first. Uh, we're talking way back in the 60s. Yeah. I'm giving my age away here. <laughs> Fireball XL5 and Stingray. Never heard of it. One was set in space, one was set underwater. Okay. So actually the first contact I had with, with science fiction was this puppet show called Fireball XL5. And then I went through, obviously, the Jerry Andersons, the Stingray, um, Thunderbirds, Captain Scarlet, and then Doctor Who. My Doctor is, is John Pertwee, yeah, the you're, third Yeah, you mean the first seasons of Doctor Who. Yeah, I, the, the first two Doctor Whos I didn't really watch, but John Pertwee is my Doctor. How did this first contact made you want to be a science fiction author. Even back then, it was always in the back of my head that this is something I would like to do. Mm. Uh, I grew up in a very rural area of the UK, and that the, the books and the TV shows were my escape out of there. So I thought, obviously, this is the only literature worthwhile. Uh, yeah. I had this thought, as I said, that I can do this. Uh, I did nothing about it, didn't do anything in school. And then in the 80s, I, I went back home to, my mother was very ill, so I, I helped her. Uh, look after her. And I thought, well, if I don't try it now, I never will. So, and I can give you the, the year date. I went out in 1987 and bought a typewriter. Oh. It was an old, a proper old manual one. Uh, and that, that is when I started writing. And I wrote short stories a lot for the first few years. And then when I'd sold enough to magazines, I thought now is the time to try a novel. And I got enough ideas to put together. So I started writing it, I think, in 89. Okay. So that was Mind Star Rising. So yeah, that was published in 93. Did you have the impression to be on your own in this genre? No, I, was, I didn't think I was on my own because um, there were quite a few British science fiction authors, same sort of era, mm. age as me. And we were all kind of just starting getting published together. And then you start going to conventions and, and there is quite a community of science fiction. I mean, we're here, exactly. I'm going to a convention tomorrow. No, you don't feel alone, I don't think. The, the actual writing process is incredibly uh, isolating and alone. Mm. If you tell someone, oh, you know, what, what do you do? Oh, I'm an author. Oh, how exciting. No, I sit in a room by myself all day and type. That's not an exciting life. But it is interesting in, in, the, in the way of what happens in, inside my head and how the story is put together. We're gonna go further with that. But before, a little quiz. Are you good at quizzes? If I know the answers, <laughs> yes. <laughs> but sometimes you can know and be bad at it. Yes. I know, I know where you're coming from. <laughs> okay, first one. What is the Fremen name of the sandworm of Arrakis in Dune? Oh, that's no, so, so unfair. <laughs> ah, I can't remember. I'm sure when I'm going to say it, you're going to say, of course. Say it. Shayulud. Mm. <laughs> you knew it? I knew of it. Of course you knew it. What is the main societal in event in Minority Report? Precog. Yeah. So what do they do? Future crime. Yeah, exactly. They, uh, they foresee future crimes. Yes. Good one. As a British, you should know this one. Oh. <laughs> no pressure. No pressure. What is the third worst poetry in the galaxy? Uh, I can't remember her name, but she's 12 years old and lives in the UK. All right. Although that's the first the first one. Ah, oh, wow. The third, you... the third one is Vogon poetry. Exactly. But now I was thinking of the first wow. one, and <laughs> she, lives, she lives somewhere in England, doesn't she? And she's 12 years old. Yeah, I have yes. her name, but 
in fact, your answer is even better because you knew the rest of the answer. <laughs> so the, the third one is the Vogon poetry yes. behind that of the Asgots of Korea and that of Paula Nancy Milston James. Yes, yes. Wow, man. Whoa. <laughs> wow, wow. What is the name of the capital planet in the foundation? Tanto. Saga. Yes. And the name of the emperor? At oh. the beginning of the story, at least. Mm. Nah. No, I can't. Cleon one. <sighs> We're here to talk about your new book, Une Brèche dans le Ciel, de la trilogie L'Arche Spatiale. How would you pitch it? It's set on a, on a generation ship. The people on it, the residents, something happened in their past to cut them off from their past. They have no knowledge of their past, no true knowledge of their past. So they're just keeping going, keeping alive until the ship arrives at the new world. Yeah. They farm the inside of the, the ship. Mm. Everything is set out, everything is logical, but it isn't. Yeah. And that is where that is where the story starts. Generational ship is something that you see in science fiction. But usually, or you see the descendants on the planet of this generational ship, or like the beginning of it. But this time you choose to write about the generation that is not supposed to arrive or doesn't know if they're about to arrive, but I don't want to spoil it. That was quite interesting to, to choose this. Is there anything that inspired you to choose this particular moment of this quest? Thank you, first of all, for saying <laughs> that was good. But, no. um, it, it, again, it's partly down to plotting. What happens in the story wouldn't be very interesting in the middle of the voyage. Yeah. We don't well, want to do too many spoilers, but yeah, uh, that's hard. <laughs> the protagonist in this is a teenager. Yeah. And so it's a kind of coming of age story and realizing that the world isn't quite what you, you know, your childhood is not what your adulthood is going to be like. Uh, but it happens in a very dramatic way, of course, in, in the story. When life changes for you. You talked about the main character, which is a girl teenager. Usually your character were very diverse, but I tend not to remember that there was a teenager as a main character. Or maybe in the Void trilogy, we have Eddard. We see a part of his youth. Yes. But usually there are grown-ups. Uh, how do you, as a grown-up man, write a teenager girl? Uh, I have a daughter. Ah, that's what I thought. <laughs> she, she won't like me saying that, but I, I put a lot of her into okay. this, this character. Mm. Hopefully she doesn't see this. Uh, she'll, well, want, uh... she'll want royalties. <laughs> so what did you put else? in order to create her? A sense of determination. My daughter is actually a, a keen athlete. Okay. So, you know, getting ready for the game, going for the game, winning the game, okay. it's it's what powers her along. The girl in, in the story here doesn't like the way things are, are happening around her, so she wants to go her own way, mm. as as teenagers and adolescents always do. So, it, again, the, that nature, that time of the story uh, and her character hopefully complement each other. Taking place in the future, are we witnessing a humanity that has beyond his bad habits? Again, I don't want to do spoilers, yeah. but that is why the ship wound up where it was yeah. when we start the story. Mm -hmm. People have had a very easy life. If you're going to build and launch a generational ship, you obviously have to have a fabulously rich society yeah. where basically all your material needs are met. A nice society, a very leisured society, possibly not as paranoid as we are today, yeah. which would be a wonderful thing to us to live in. But when you start going flying out to the stars, we really don't know what's out there. Yeah. So maybe you just need to be a little bit cautious and obviously they weren't. The generation ship, it's a closed ecology. Yeah. Mm. You have to live within your means. Yeah. That makes it a very regulated society. And of course, youth always rebels against mm. regulation, uh, which fed in nicely again. So there is this sense of confinement in the mm. ship, which she wants to, to break out of, and she wants to do something different and be something different. Mm. What would be the, um, the main aspects of the book that you would like someone to explore while they're reading it? the nature of the way society is structured and why is it structured okay. like that. Mm -hmm. What I would like someone to come out of this would be to look around the world we live in mm -hmm. and question things. Is that really the best way to do it? Is this behavior the best way that people can interact with each other? Those basic questions, because I don't think they're asked enough at the moment. We seem like we're, we're, we're losing control because mm. uh, nobody wants what's happening. But why isn't our leadership veering away from what's happening? People are feeling very disenfranchised, and I don't think they're questioning why. Yeah, especially <laughs> nowadays. Yeah, especially nowadays. <laughs> In terms of writing style, this book is a little bit more direct. If I compared it to your previous books, there are uh, 
how can I say that? Big? Big, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they are big. I mean, The Night Dawn itself, it's a very long book. That's the longest sci-fi novel, I think. Probably, from memory, it's one point Two million words. Oof. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a lot of characters. This time one character. It's very direct, very precise. And the rhythm is a little bit more uh, paced. Yeah. What made you decide for this change, if I'm right? No, you are. This is the first book I've written in first person. Ah, that's true. Yeah. It is, yeah. And it's in one place. It happens in one place yeah. the whole time. Mm -hmm. And it is aimed, I hate the term aimed at, it is, would appeal more to a younger readership. Ah. So you do need to have something happening every few pages which, which holds people's attention. And I wanted to do a different style and a different type of writing. This is why I, I will write several books in one universe and then move on to something else because I don't want to be someone who writes 20 books yeah. in one place. I know my readers sometimes <laughs> ask me when is book 10, when is book 15 coming, but I, I feel that as a writer I have to move on and have to do something different. I took the a younger audience into consideration, okay. shall we say. Okay. That's something that you didn't do before? No, no. I, I, but no, I have done it once. I wrote a children's fant a magical fantasy series. Okay, I didn't know that. Uh, I don't think it's out in France. Ah, maybe. That was deliberately aimed at that because I spent a lot of time in the evenings with my ch when my children were younger reading to them, and I didn't like all the books. Mm. Some of them are not good, so I thought I'll give that a go. Okay. And I, pu I put them in it as a bribe to start to, so they would read books more. I don't think it worked very well. <laughs> so I have done younger audiences deliberately. This, I would hope that you know, people of our age can pick up that and enjoy it as much as, as the other side. It is different, but it, it, it has the same kind of tensions, I hope, the same uh, exploration of the unknown, the same problems that we all face. I know it's, it's classed as young adult and nobody likes to be classified, but I get why it's done. But I would, I, I, again, I hope most people who like my work would be able to at least enjoy this. Well, I can give you only my opinion. When it comes to cinema, for example, the best uh, children movies and I say it like that because for me it's not only for children actually it would be movies that will please the children the teenagers and the adults yeah when it talks about like universal aspects that we can all find in our lives and I really enjoyed it because I was like okay I, I felt that the style was more punchy the themes the general story is quite interesting it has action it has suspense, uh, love, everything that everybody feels. I can guarantee you that even an adult, I'm not that old, but uh, would enjoy it. Uh, I hope so. I think glad, that's glad to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to go further, talk about the other, your other books. But first, a little quiz. Okay, this one is hard. In the last Battlestar Galactica TV show, how many silent models are there? And can you name them more or less? There was five? Oh, they are the final five, which are secrets. Ah. Uh, but there are eight before. Oh. So there are 13. <laughs> I can't name 13. Well, the boomer turned out to be one, didn't she? Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's the number eight, Sharon Valerie. Yes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Without naming them, just describing them. Oh, also. Trisha Halfer. Yeah, number six. I can't remember his name. He was sort of the master sergeant. Uh, um, master chief. The Chief. The he mechanic. was in charge, yes. Mechanic. He was in charge Ga of... Yeah. Galentiro. Yeah. Um, no, it's gone. There is John Cavill, the first one. He was in uh, Scott Quantum. It's not the name in English. You know, with Scott Bakula. Oh, from, yes, what's yes. What's the name in English? Quantum Leap. Quantum Leap. He was the sidekick. Yes. There is Lil Ben Connie, Diana Byers, uh, who was a uh, Xena princess. Oh, yes, of yeah. course, yes. Simon O'Neill, Aaron Doral, number seven, Daniel, D who doesn't appear, Samuel Anders, Tori Foster, yeah. and Ellen Tai and Saul Tai, the EXO. The baddest. Yes, the that, yeah. And you said Guy and yeah. Tara. It's a hard one. Mm, it's yes. Hard. <laughs> <laughs> it may be the hardest. Okay, so, good. But, okay. In Star Wars, what are called the microscopic alien forms that allows people to use the force? Mycondrian. Midi chlorians. Close. Was that a good idea? No. Nah. Usually in all your stories, aliens tend to know more about the universe than humans. Not especially on the technical aspects, more about like mystical or, well, quite everything, more or less. What does it say about your vision of humanity and yourself in a way? 
Well, this is the thing about aliens. Do they know more or do they just look at it in a different way, mm -hmm. in the alien way? Mm -hmm. This grew out of the first question you asked me, the, the, what were my influences? I, I didn't mention Star Trek. But, you know, aliens used to be the man with the rubber mask and the big forehead and they would just be slightly different from us. Aliens, I think, need to be portrayed in a more sophisticated light than that. Or a very basic light, as in alien, mm. where it just exists for one thing and it's very good at it, hunting us down. This whole perception of the universe thing is, is what helps to make aliens aliens, I think. A lot of people are very fond of the aliens I created in the Commonwealth saga, the Prime. Mm. I quite like the Lysilf in the uh, Night's Dawn trilogy. I think that's a very different way of looking at the universe. And they, to a degree, don't understand us either. If neither side understands the other properly, that makes for a great deal of conflict. Can you see the other person's point of view? So it does reflect back on us. So yeah, that's why I tend to structure them the way you find them in my books. Literature is better on that aspect, that cinema, because it's, it's more complicated in cinema to show a real different life form than humans. Yeah. I tend to, to take Avatar as an example because James Cameron needs a love story, so his human character, it's hard to fall in love with the blob, you know? It's, it's quite hard to create emotions with that. Yes. But I tend to criticize cinema science fiction on that aspect because I think that sometimes they're taking it too easy. And, and I agree with you, especially with the lie self that you, you mentioned, that is, the true difference, like only a kind of energy that only exists to know things. Mm. Do they understand us? Do we understand them, etc.? But I have the feeling that uh, in your books, usually we can understand each other, more or less. And more than knowing more than we do, they hide secrets from us. Yes, it's, it's should we be trusted with the high levels ah. of knowledge. Um, I am a cynic at heart. Mm. An optimist, but a cynic. If we didn't have the atom bomb now, mm. would an alien come along and think, oh, that's a, a good thing to give to people on this yeah. planet? Um, so it's, it's kind of based like that, and it kind of, it does portray us as slightly inferior. Primitive. I would say. Primitive, <laughs> yes. Um, but then this, this is the wonder of science fiction, is that it's the optimism it can contain. Mm. I tend to think that, that my books are like, yeah, you know, we've done pretty well to get here, all things considered. But we can go a bit further, can't we? Mm. You know, economically, socially, politically, we this this cannot be the the pinnacle. Yeah, it really I can't. Yes, the, the, I do as well. So, which is why I put my characters through hell. Mm. But they do tend to have an optimistic outlook at the end. Mm. I would hope. That's what I like because, as you said, technologically sometimes we are quite at the same level, but it's it's on the spiritual aspect, philosophy, philosophical aspect yes. yeah. that we are quite. Yeah. Beyond. But um, I'm also wondering if those aliens, as powerful and superior as they are, if it's not also a flaw to be that superior. Now you're getting to the difference between individuals and society. Exactly. Um, society tends to hold a culture together so that one or two people cannot send the entire society into war. Mm. Uh, would be the, the prime example of that. Uh, I think in Pandora's Star and Judas Unchained, there's a, a, some individual aliens that are they're really quite flawed. Yeah. But the, the society as a whole is, is beneficial. Mm. So yeah, the individuals can be flawed even, even in the aliens, I feel. The only perfect society is the prime. Technically, Technically. yes, it is, yeah, but it's, the Prime's viewpoint on life and the universe is so different to ours. Yeah. It boils down to the, the question of, are you justified in genociding mm, something like exactly. that? Are we just going to use brute force or are we going to try and think our way out of it to be the better people? Yeah. We're going to go further with science fiction in general, okay. especially space opera. Yeah. But before that, a little quiz. Can you name at least five Star Trek movies? First Contact. Yeah. Star Trek The Motion Picture. First one. Uh, Wrath of Khan. Yeah. <laughs> you have 14 of them. Uh, I can't think of them. I do know that I do know more than that. The Voyage Home. Yep. The Quest for Spock. 
search search, search for sport ah. search for sport that's good yeah, yeah okay. insurrection not the best one <laughs> no i'll call it a draw there no yeah. but the, that's good yeah you had the motion picture wrath of khan search of spock the voyage home you said it the final frontier uh, then discovered country uh star trek generations then first ah, contact generations I then insurrection then nemesis then Star Trek from J.J. Abrams. Oh, of course, of yes, the uh, Kelvin timeline, <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah, exactly. Then Into Darkness and Beyond. That's telling that I didn't even consider no. the last three. <laughs> you didn't like it? They were okay. The last one I really no. didn't like. No, the last one's bad. Uh, yeah, yeah. Simon Pegg wrote mm, it. Mm. I tend to like JJ. Yeah, uh, it's, it's not the case of everyone, but it, uh, yeah, too much. As they say, too much lens flare yeah. in the first. I, I tend to like them. I, I don't know. That's that's how I am. Yeah. What was the first sci-fi movie ever? Uh, well, Metropolis is the obvious answer. <laughs> But there's the one, it's French, isn't it? Where the, yeah, the bullet good. goes in the eye. Good, yes. And I can't think of the name of it. But you have it. Yeah. Le Voyage dans la Lune, it's the Voyage French name. Yes. But and I didn't manage to find the English name of the movie. It, it is subtitled Star Film. Maybe it's the name he gave for exported. You said it, you're a space opera writer. You didn't write only space opera, but mainly. Mainly. And even though you put aspects of other genres in your books, what appealed you most in this genre? You just said it. It can encompass anything you want. Mm. Brian Aldiss called it widescreen Baroque. I also have um, very fond memories when I was a teenager of reading E. Doc Smith. He wrote the Lensman series in the 40s, which as I say, I loved when I was a teenager. I have no intention of rereading them because like I say, they were from the 40s. Yeah. Um, so yes, and it's just this ability to, to write about whatever you want to write about. I don't understand why more people don't do it. In science fiction in general, you can do whatever you want. When you're doing space opera, you're going everywhere in the universe and everywhere in the universe means that all possibility is allowed so from the beginning you wanted to give something else than pure science fiction why why did you want it to to expand this view of the genre the night storm specifically it started with the idea of the possessed coming back mm. can't be stopped yeah. We certainly couldn't stop it today. So I thought, well, what kind of society can stand a chance against this happening? Well, that's got to be, you know, fairly far in the future. Mm. So we're going to be out in the stars. No, it all just played in. That's how it happened. And then I realized as I was writing it, well, you can do anything in this specific part of the genre. Maybe because everything was done already and you had to... Yeah, um, to a degree. Um, I just wanted to write something that was my own. It gives a darker vibe than the genre has usually. Especially with this idea in French, it, it is translated as the void, but I think it's beyond in English, where we go when we die, you know? Yes. What's the name in English? It, the beyond. The beyond, okay. Yes, but not everybody does. Oh, it's been 20 years. Uh, yeah, I, so... I'll, I'll let you off. Okay. It's those that haven't lived a full life. I have to re read it again. Oh, oh that's because, a commitment. Uh, yeah, no, yeah. Well, uh, actually, I want to, but yeah, okay. But because for me, it was whole humanity that was going there. Okay, no, no. it's not. Uh, because for me, it was, it's very dark. You, it's still quite dark, but because you can stay there for millions of years and there is nothing. I was like, whoa, that's, that's a horrible way to spend the rest of your existence. Yes, yeah. So, and it, it puts empathy on the bad guys because you can understand why they want to go back oh, yes. to life. Well, that's a that's a huge part of, of writing for me is that there, there is no black and white. You can't do just bad guy. Why are they bad? Because they're bad. You have to give them a motivation, a reason. If you cannot write a viewpoint that is diametrically opposed to your own, then you possibly shouldn't be thinking of writing. Mm -hmm. You can't build a book that has just your viewpoint in it. It's amazing what people do read into my books mm -hmm. uh, that isn't there, that was never put in. That always astonishes me what people think they read in it. I would hope that I can argue from, from a different point of view. I don't think a book could be cohesive without that ability. We're back to the, to why the possessed did what they did. Mm. They're not bad, they're lost souls. They really are lost souls. Mm. I really enjoyed it. I, I think it's my favorite. I Thank think. you. Which one is your favorite? 
<laughs> Always the new one. Ah, that's Always. Nice. No, seriously. <laughs> um, because you're so invested in it by the mm. time you've finished. Mm. This is it. I've done it. I've made the best one ever. And then you write the next one. How do you find the energy to write? I'm asking because I'm trying to. <laughs> that's, that's an interesting question. How do you not write is my question. Ah, that's good. Um, it's what I do. Yeah. There is no method I can teach you and yeah. show you. Um, to me, it's it's the natural thing. I mean, some people, you know, athletes can sprint. Footballers know how to pass the ball to get it into the perfect position for a goal. I know how to write science fiction. Mm. I mean, if you looked at some of that early stuff, and I don't want to look at the very early stuff, yeah. the very early short stories, hopefully you can see a progression in the writing, the, mm. the competency of the writing. But it's just something that, that seems obvious to me. I mean, I struggle putting stories together because I do a lot of note making at the start. Putting the plot together and weaving it together is always time consuming and I get very irritated with myself for not seeing things. But once I've put that story together, then the writing is just, as every, every writer will tell you, it's just a real slog. Yeah, you just yeah. sit down in the morning, oh, we've got to get this done. Especially sometimes I think that's the problem when you start. You want it to be perfect directly, with, uh, yeah, but it's not possible. It's not. Yeah. yeah, that's another thing that's come on. Interesting. A lot of interviewers say, "Oh, you know, how many drafts do you make of yeah. the story?" Whereas, I, for me, that that kind of thing that goes back to the manual typewriter, where you would write it out, then you'd go through it with a pen, and then you type it out fresh. The beauty of having a, a screen and word processing is that I I almost revise as I go. Um, you know, if a sentence doesn't fit right, you can just change it instantly on the screen. Mm. When I start in the morning, if you want to go through the process. Uh, I start in the morning and I will read through what I did yesterday and I will revise it and make it as well as I can so that by, by lunchtime, say, the head is, is back in exactly where I left off and I do the, the fresh stuff in the afternoon and evening. So oh. that's the process. Okay. But this is, this is not a this is how you do it. Mm. That's what works for me. Yeah, I think everyone is diverse on that aspect. For example, me, when I write the episodes on YouTube, if someone calls me at the same time, it tends to to take me out of it, you know? And especially now that I'm trying to write a novel, it's even worse. If I'm in it and I have to do something else during an hour or so, yeah. it's very difficult to go back. But it's also because I don't have the time to only focus on that. Maybe there, if there is one thing to do is take time only for that, maybe. I'd love to be able to do that, but I have a life. Yeah, um, that was my You know, the, the, kids, the kids have to go yeah. to school. Do they? Yes. Well. Yeah, well, they, they need taking. Oh, okay. Make them go. <laughs> All sorts of things interfere. I tend to write nowadays that the new stuff tends to be in the evening when there, there is no interruption. Okay. It has changed over the years as, as my life has changed. True. You've got to adapt to it. So you would call yourself a night writer or? <laughs> no, because I've got to get up in the morning yeah. early to do the school run. Um, an evening writer. Yeah. An evening, evening. writer. Right. Night anymore. I've always wondered because sometimes I'm reading a book and arriving at the end, I have the feeling that sometimes the author is tired of his own universe. That maybe he or she realized that it, it took too long and he's fed up with it. And sometimes I have the feeling that some good books, the end is, is written yeah. very quickly. Did you felt that at one point or do you manage to find this will to finish it with the same concentration, I would say, that the rest of the book? Um, good question. Mm -hmm. I always have the ending before I ah, start okay. because the, the, big, the bigger they are, the more complex they are. Speaking personally, I have to have an ending ready. Okay. Uh, I can't write a thousand pages and then go, how am I going to finish this? Mm -hmm. That would be a terrifying thing. Some writers can, they just start with a blank page and just start writing. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I cannot do that. To give you the typical example, um, if I'm writing a trilogy, it'll take four years. The first six months are just doing notes. Yeah. and the, the chapter outlines and stuff like that. Deadlines are not an author's friend. Yeah, they come along, um, nobody ever delivers a book on time. So I would, I would hope that I keep the same level of intensity and concentration in the writing. Yeah. Uh, I've just gone through it with the, the last book I've been finishing off, which was long again, I mean much longer than, than this book. Even though I knew exactly what each character had to do, it never seemed to stop. I was about a month over the deadline and oh. I really was working half the night yeah. to get it finished because I didn't want to just write, oh, the end there, that, that, that's it, that'll do. 
I wanted to have the proper descriptions, the proper dialogue, everything had to be perfect for me, as perfect as I can get it. Are you sad sometimes to finish a book? When I'm writing a series, when you get to the end of the overall arc, the overall story, then yes, it's quite an interesting experience. You're, you're Actually, you are very glad to have finished it, mm -hmm. but at the same time, slightly sad to leave it. Oh, I understand. Yeah. Okay, we're going to go further, but before, a little quiz. Give me the three laws of robotics. Uh, no human may be harmed by action or inaction. It's not said like that. It's not said so like that, is it? It's a robot may not injure a human being or through inaction no. allow a human yes. being okay. to come to harm. Robot must always obey a human being unless it transgresses the first law. Exactly. Robot must defend itself or look after itself unless it conflicts with the first and second laws. Exactly. Very good. How fast does the DeLorean time travel machine must go to travel through time and with how much electrical power? Oh, I, I can hear him say it. 1.8 million kilojoules? No, but you have some good figures. <laughs> uh, and was it eight, 86 kilometers an hour? Almost. 88 ah. miles per hour and 2.21 gigawatts. Of course it was, yes, <laughs> yes, gigawatts. Can you give me four adaptations of Philip Caddick work? There are many. <sighs> yes. Screamers. Oh, good one. <laughs> no. Android stream of electronic sheep. <sighs> there was the one which had Robert Downey Jr. In, and they did like a cartoon overlay and I cannot remember the name of it. <laughs> uh, a scanner darkly. A scanner darkly. Yes, you're mm -hmm. right. And we talked about one of them. We did. A prequel one. I can't think of the name. <laughs> Minority, Minority report. report. Yes, of course. Okay, at least one more. You have four, but I helped you. You did. Um, oh, <laughs> my memory is not what it was. No. Total recall. Oh, both of them. Both of them. Uh, yeah. There's only one. <laughs> the Truman Show, it's more uh, a free adaptation, but it, okay, is. Right. it is uh, supposed to be. Paycheck. Oh, you, you Ben Affleck. Ben, ben Affleck, Affleck yes. yes. The Man in the High Castle. Of the course, TV show. yes. Good, good, good. Okay. Since cyberpunk, we didn't really have a new sci-fi genre. Is this because in the 21st century, you don't have like a complete new parading? I will completely dispute oh, that. No. You are okay. so wrong. Right. Um, Damn! Okay, first of all, I hate categories anyway. I understood that. <laughs> um, the book I'm reading while I'm uh, traveling around in France at the moment is Hilary St. John Mandel's The, the Glass Hotel. Mm -hmm. Is science fiction, but not in any way that I would write. It's completely different. Claire North does some very different stuff. She started off with 15 Lies of Harry August and has progressed mm -hmm. uh, doing her own thing from there. It's all very different. It's just that I have the feeling that it's it's more like um, the evolution of science fiction is more about to be more open-minded in its themes and its uh, way of, of showing them. Mm -hmm. And it will take from what I would call genres, different genres yes. that put them together. But even though I still have the feeling that, for, for example, cy cyberpunk was a new parody with the new technologies and internet and the robotic yes. and AI, there was something that was quite deeply different than before. And I don't have this feeling in the 21st century. Even with the biogenetics modification, etc., you have biopunk, but it's not a new parody, you know? Or, or at least for now, I didn't find any, any novel or, or movies that that shows us something completely different. My argument to you would be it's now so wide. Mm. There is so much out there, so many different categories, if you like, that they, they become undefinable. You can't, you can't have a category for everything. You can say, oh, it was quite similar to that, that and that mixed together, but it hasn't got its own distinct. There is so much out there, there's so much new and so much being explored and so many ways of looking at our lives and futures. The near future stuff is the most interesting because that's the, the stuff we fear writing the most because we're going to be out of date yeah, before it yeah. hits the shelves. So it's all this, the way that, as you said, the new technology impacts on our lives and, and the difference it will make or not make. It's fascinating, okay, near future technology is a genre, which 20 years ago would have just been classed as a thriller. True. There is a lot out there. And you get the, the, the huge blending of genres. The Night Storm itself was a mix of two genres, science yeah. fiction and horror, yeah. which is interesting because I don't really like horror. <laughs> I don't read much of it. I would 
would say that there is there is just so much out there it's become unclassifiable mm. so the future of science fiction is to be just science fiction and that's all yeah, yeah okay. it will all it will always be moving onwards mm. all right well thank you very much peter thank you we're going to say goodbye but first a little quiz give me three sci-fi movie movies with sean connery zardoz Okay, I knew you knew this one. <laughs> and it's quite hard because I thought there are only three, but there are four. Are we counting James Bond as science no, fiction? No, 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 uh, no. I don't. Okay. Oh, um, it's the high noon one on Jupiter's moon. Exactly. On your Io. Io. Outland. Of course. You have it. And what was the third then? You still have two and they are the hardest. <laughs> one is tricky. Go on, tell me what okay, they are. Okay, Highlander 2. <laughs> yes, no, two was not good. It is a science fiction movie because they changed the whole yeah. explanation of yeah. everything. So yeah. well. <laughs> and the Meteor, which is a 79 oh, movie. Oh, no, uh, I've seen it. Yeah. Yes. And I completely forgot that he, that he was in it and I just discovered that five minutes ago. Yes. How many people were killed by the drop of 15 antimatter planet busters on the planet Garissa by the Omutans in your book, The Reality Dysfunction? I'm going to say 25 million? Yeah. No. No? No. Well, at least not according to Wikipedia. <laughs> okay, what did Wikipedia say? 95 millions. Oh, gosh, I killed a lot of people. <laughs> you killed a lot those, of people. I? Yes. <laughs> Very good. Very good, Peter. You, Thank you. Uh, we are at 75% of good ah. answers. Well, more Phew. or less. Thank you. Thank you very much again, Peter. I hope you enjoyed yourself. I certainly did. Yeah. Hey, what are your news? What are you working on? I'm not allowed to say much. A two book series set in a completely new universe. Mm. I've just finished the first one and handed it in for editing. It should be out within a year. It's a very big space opera. Mm. The Archip trilogy is, is over. It's English. over, yes, it is done. Since when? Two years ago. There was some kind of uh, epidemic at that time. I. Yes, we, we did have one back then, yeah. Well, it's the first of many, so don't worry. Uh. <laughs> thank you very much, Peter. It was really nice to have you. Oh, thank you. See you soon. Merci pour votre écoute, citoyennes et citoyens. J'espère que cet entretien vous a plu autant qu'à moi. N'oubliez pas donc la sortie du prochain livre de Peter F. Hamilton, Une brèche dans le ciel. Il sortira le 7 juin 2023 aux éditions Brajlon. Merci à eux pour avoir organisé cette rencontre. J'ai vraiment apprécié le livre. C'est un petit peu différent de son style habituel, hein, moins, comme on l'a dit, euh, moins euh, prolixe, mais euh, efficace avec du suspense, de l'amour, de l'action. Il euh, y a tout ce qu'il faut pour vous plaire. En attendant, n'hésitez pas à vous abonner à Nexus 6 si ce n'est pas le cas, à activer la cloche également. Et si vous souhaitez nous soutenir, eh bien, il y a notre page Tipeee. Merci à toutes et à tous, et à très bientôt sur le Nexus 6. Ciao